Good evening, friends of the Corning Museum of Glass. I'm Marv Bolt, curator of science and technology here at the museum, and it's my privilege to welcome you here this evening and to introduce our special guest, Max Coyle, who will launch our Behind the Glass series for 2017. Now this year, we will open two new exhibitions, one on Tiffany's glass mosaics, that will open in May, and we have one on the delightfully surprising, curious, and curiouser finds at the Rakow Library, and that will open in April. This past week, as planned, we closed down one of our temporary exhibitions on the marine invertebrate glass models of Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka. But we're pleased to remind you that there's still time until the end of March to enjoy revealing the invisible, the history of glass and the microscope. It features one of the oldest microscopes in the world, one made by Antony van Leeuwenhoek, and we have a replica that you can take a look at at the end of the evening as well, as well as the latest innovation in microscopes, one that has the potential to make truly revolutionary changes in personal and public health around the world. That is the Foldscope, which, of course, not coincidentally, is the topic of this evening's presentation. So our speaker, Max Coyle, has a strong background in molecular biology research and, as you'll see in person, in science communication. He's especially motivated to change the way science is usually taught. He says, usually, you read a bunch of books, and then you answer a bunch of questions, and afterwards, you might get the chance to observe something for yourself. And he says, well, you know, we really think that sequence should be switched around. Now, the fold scope that Max will describe for us is cheap enough to be disposable and robust enough to fit in the pocket of every student, maybe even your own pockets. And it delivers real insights. An ingenious series of origami folds made by the user in just a few minutes creates a hardy instrument that holds and protects this grapeseed-sized lens that's powerful enough to help you see some truly amazing things. Now, all you need is a traditional glass slide or, if you don't happen to have one of those in your pocket, a little piece of sticky tape, and that's all you need and you adjust the pressure on your thumbs, and that allows you to fo focus the device with micron precision. And that crisp, high-definition image can match the quality of the images produced by traditional microscopes that cost hundreds or even thousands of times as much because the fold scope costs one buck. Right? It's really an amazing object. And, by the way, along with his team, we have, they have another uh, instrument as well. And that team is a four-person team, Jim Sobolski, Christine Karahara, and Manu Prakash, who is a professor of bioengineering at Stanford University. Now, they're gearing up their efforts to produce even more tools for what they call the frugal science movement. And just this morning in my Facebook feed, of course, that's how we start off the day, right? There in my Facebook feed was their next device, the paper centrifuge that costs 20 cents. <laughs> All right, so a buck, 20 cents, the next tool is gonna cost four cents, so the pressure is on. <laughs> it's really amazing. In the event, please join me in welcoming our speaker for this evening, Max Coyle. It's up to you. Well, thank you, everybody. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in Corning. Um, I was expecting uh, snow being from California. And what you guys gave me was my hometown of Seattle. So <laughs> thank you for making me feel welcomed. Um, so one thing that's been great, I've spent a lot of the day um, here at the Museum of Glass Sand um, up at uh, Sullivan Park at the Corning Research Facilities. And I've seen a phenomenal array of ways in which, in which glass can be used. Um, and it's fun to start with the material and say what are all the things we can do with it. And you know, to some extent, that's what we've done in um, with Foldscope and with some of the other frugal science tools that we're interested in. Um, something as simple as paper can give you a really wide array of applications. Um, of course, 
in the fold scope you see, like we always still need glass. So we still use a glass lens in the fold scope. Um, so I'm gonna structure my talk today in sort of two different segments. In the first half, I'm gonna talk a lot about the technology behind the fold scope itself and the instrument. You're probably curious, you know, how does it work? How do you make it? Um, how do you make it for a dollar? These are the questions uh, you probably wanna hear about. Um, but the second half, I want to focus a lot on the community behind Foldscope and you know, our goal is to really reach people and I think that's what this intro slide demonstrates a little bit is there's sort of a universal reaction to looking in the Foldscope and you're like, oh, am I seeing anything? Am I using this right? And then something clicks and it comes into focus and you realize sort of the power of what's at your fingertips. Um, and so, you know, we've built a community um, that's continuing to grow and hopefully in the next year is gonna grow very tremendously as we scale up the production. So I wanna talk a lot about our uh, community today as well. Um, so this is a simple, like really cheesy diagram. You know, I tend to actually stay away from these kinds of things because like what does this mean? But um, what I think it demonstrates to me is that science is, um, so I, I, I think that, um, that as Marv uh, alluded to in the intro, I think um, science often gets treated as sort of simply the acquisition of knowledge and you can read a bunch and the more you read the more you know about science and um, in practice in the you know the way science is done whether it's here at Corning or whether it's in a lab in Stanford is it's always about making observations and synthesizing those observations with bodies of information and the two are really symbiotic. Um, you, you see something, then you go back and say, oh, what did I see? And you, and you read a bunch about it, and then that inspires new questions. And there's always this trade-off between information and experience as uh, represented here. Um, and so the problem with this model is that um, we have sort of a um, disparity in our education system where the information is cheap, but it's actually pretty expensive to have the experience of doing science because equipment is so expensive. And so, you know, as early as elementary school, you know, you're learning about maybe cell theory, you're learning about biology, um, and that continues through high school. And for most students, or for many students, it's not actually until the university level, if they get there and if they major in science and if they do well in their classes, maybe that they have the opportunity to do research on their own and actually feel like they've been afforded the, um, the ability to make observations. And that, um, I mean, one, that's unfair to students that are interested in science and it turns a lot of people off at a young age. And as a society, it kind of makes us a much less scientifically literate society because we leave it as a thing that's entirely up to experts and we would like to sort of reverse this model by bringing observation into you know, all stages of science education. So even if you've only done science through elementary or high school, you still have an idea of what it's about and you've you know, asked your own questions and you've gone through that process. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with frugal science. And, um, you know, I address this, but frugality is important because of how expensive most science tools are and the distribution of resources around the world. So there's um, a couple numbers that I want to point out to you here. Um, there, this, this number one billion, and this is the number of children uh, living in poverty in the world currently. And the other number is here, the poverty what it was defined as poverty, which is less than two and a half dollars a day. And so the combination of these two numbers is really why we focus on an instrument that is not just somewhat cheaper than most instruments, but is actually orders of magnitude cheaper. Um, how do you reach you know, a, billion a billion children around the world that can only afford maybe a dollar or two on a microscope, if that? Um, and so the answer is you need to make the cost of your instrument very, very, very low. Um, so this is not just motivated by looking up statistics. This is actually uh, an experiential process that we've had uh, in the Foldscope team. And so we've done workshops all over the world now in India and um, many, many countries in Africa. Um, we went to Madagascar most recently. Um, and what we see in these situations is, you know, plenty of curated, curious, smart, and motivated people that just don't have the resources to necessarily follow up on all of their questions. Um, in some cases, microscopes have, you know, are there and have fungus growing on them, or there would be a fully functioning microscope that just no one knows how to use because that information hasn't been transferred. Um, and so it's about making the microscope cheap, it's about making it affordable, and very easy, easily approachable. Um, so these are some of the, the uh, 
the things that we've put into our design process. Um, the other thing that's important is this idea, like I mentioned, of ownership. So it's one thing to have a microscope that's sort of behind closed doors that you know, only a doctor is allowed to use. And it's another thing to make it something that you actually own and can carry around in your pocket and integrate into your life. And if you have a question, you can simply answer it. Um, and then the final, I think, take home lesson, I mean, there's a bunch, but one of the ones I want to talk about now is um, the way that local context drives different questions. You know, we can sit here in the US and decide that there's a certain number of questions that we are interested in pursuing. Um, but what we find around the world is that people are interested in very different things based on where you are. So um, we've had a user um, um, in Sierra Leone be really interested in how can I use microscopy to identify fake drugs? And they're actually grinding up, grinding up uh, specimens of fake drugs and looking for microscopic differences in the crystalline structure. Um, people are interested in sanitation. They're interested in agriculture. Um, there's all these questions that come out of specific local contexts. And that's another um, reason why you know, we want to reach these audiences is, uh, and give them ownership over the tools so they can answer their own questions. Um, briefly, we can say, what does the experience of actually doing science look like? So this is from a workshop. Um, and uh, we can see, I'll play a video here of a student looking at an ant for the first time under a microscope. Oh my gosh, I see a little bit of a face. You see the face? Let's find out. <laughs> so I like about, what I like about this video is one, that it's adorable and <laughs> it's a great video to show people to show kind of the excitement that, um, that, you, that you can have from, you know, from looking under a microscope. Um, but there's more going on here, and you know she's making this observation. She's excited about it, but she's also synthesizing information. Um, you can see even in that first glimpse, she's identifying. Oh, like I can think I can see its face, um, and then this is from that same student uh, later on doing a drawing and um, and making some comments about the ant. Um, and so you can see she says, "I wonder what are the hairs in their legs? I think they are fingers." Um, She's not totally off. These are, you know, these are sensors um, for the ant. Um, but I think an important thing also for us from a philosophical standpoint is when you're encouraging people to actually go out and be curious and make their own observations, it's important to um, kind of often strip any idea of being wrong about a thing. Um, and rather than say, oh, that's not the term for it, those aren't their fingers, is not the approach we want to take. You want to ask more, get them to ask more questions. Um, and so this model of sort of curiosity-driven science um, often needs to um, come with this idea that, you know, you're not just trying to match what you see with information that's already out there in a textbook. Uh, you should be, you know, or you can be asking your own questions, making your own observations, and eventually that instills sort of a confidence um, and a, a ability to look at the world and, and think you have something to ask about it. Um, but so again, why, back to backtrack a little bit, why interested in making a microscope in the first place. If your goal is to you know, reach a bunch of students in the sciences, you know, there's plenty of scientific tools. Um, uh, the microscope, I mean, we uh, started partly because it's within our field. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a molecular biologist by training. Manu is a bioengineer at Stanford. Um, and so a microscope naturally came to us, though you know, a different instrument might come to another person. Um, but the microscope really, I mean, revolutionized and created the field of biology. Um, this is um, shortly, this was a, a graphic that was made shortly after um, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek um, first made the observations from his microscope. And this is a uh, English mom looking at a monster soup in her teacup. And these are all the, the microorganisms that they realized were floating around in their water sources. Um, and so eventually out of this came germ theory and Pasteur and the idea that, you know, most of the um, infectious diseases are transmitted by germs of some kind, most of which are microscopic. Um, and so just in terms of teaching biology, it's really the tool that you want is a microscope. But it goes beyond that. Um, and we found sort of a lot of even unanticipated uses for microscopy. Um, one that I'll point to just because it's recently on my mind is uh, the field of textile anthropology. Um, I had the privilege of uh, last week meeting with a textile conservationist at the Met Museum 
in New York, and they're interested in taking portable microscopes with them in the field so they can identify and date textiles and make decisions about their conservation before having to actually lug the whole thing back to a lab. Um, and so that was an a application we never would have foreseen uh, coming from a biology lab. Um, also useful in physics, so Brownian motion is something that Albert Einstein described in 1905 as, you know, seeing uh, molecules wiggle in a, um, in a fluid solution as they're being kind of bombarded by the energy of their neighbors. And you can do, actually do this with a very, very dilute solution of milk. And so this is a pinprick of milk in a water droplet, and um, it'll zoom in in a second. And you can actually see the triglyceride particles uh, exhibiting Brownian motion under the fold scope. I'll give it a second to zoom in. Here we go. And so this is just the energy of the molecules crashing into each other. Um, and so that's, again, a, a, a application that, you know, uh, is not, not within biology, but is, but is important for teaching science. Um, this is a brief history of microscopes. This is a poor simulation of what is currently going on at the library. Um, so you should definitely go check that exhibit out today. I, I, had, the, I had the treat to look at it. Um, a couple things about these microscopes. One is you can see uh, they sort of increase in complexity as we go through time. The other thing you can notice about it is that the overall sort of form stays pretty similar, this kind of inverted compound microscope form, which you now find in labs you know, all over the world. Um, and so you know, there hasn't been a lot of change in the thinking about what a microscope looks like. Uh, and I think a lot of people, when you tell them that you work on an origami microscope, they imagine that it looks like this, but that it's folded out of paper into, you know, like a paper crane would be, you know, into this like three-dimensional box-like thing that is a microscope. Um, and what it actually looks like is this. And so those of you who saw um, the demo booth earlier, you've seen this in person, and I'll be, I'll be showing some after my talk today as well. It's this the kind of three by seven inch um, tool here with almost no thickness to it. Um, it's just like a few, a few millimeters thick, really. Um, so we'll go into sort of the design principles that led us to this point. Um, but you know, the, the important attributes of the fold scope are that it's affordable. It is less, uh, about a dollar in parts um, to source everything for it. Um, it's extremely portable. It can fit in your pocket. It doesn't weigh anything, basically. Um, it's surprisingly durable. So we actually make this out of a synthetic paper that is uh, waterproof and also very hard to tear. Um, it's, we've actually had an elephant step on it during one of our field visits, and the fold scope uh, uh, survived. So it's elephant proof. Um, and it's a very, very powerful microscope. And sometimes this gets lost a little bit in the translation of presenting fold scope, which is that um, in some ways it's, you know, I've, I've had to learn a lot of different skills as I've worked on fold scope, and one is marketing. So this is not a cheap but powerful microscope, it's a powerful but cheap microscope. Um, and, but, but it really is, and so we can get magnifications up to 2000x. We can get very, very good resolution with the fold scope. Um, you're not really, I mean, you're supplying a toy in the sense of it's for kids, it's cheap, but you're not, you're supplying a very valid scientific instrument. Um, we've had a user in Mexico discover an unknown species of nematode with the fold scope. We've had people look at embryonic stem cell division under the fold scope. It has very, very real applications, and you can sort of take it as far as your interest permits. Um, which is something that is, is really important to us. Um, um, yeah, so this is just features of it. I mean, it's something you would take with you in your pocket, like a banana. Maybe you wouldn't keep a banana in your pocket. Maybe one of those protectors. I got one of those off Amazon. But um, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a traditional compound microscope, and this is the fold scope here. And it has three really main viewing modes. Um, you can hold it up to your eye and use natural light to illuminate your sample. Um, so this mode requires no external electricity. It requires nothing but the fold scope itself. And so you're getting really microscopy for a dollar. Um, the other option you have with fold scope is yeah, you can um, hook it up to your smartphone and actually use that to record images and videos of what you're seeing. Um, also provides a little bit um, that kind of your screen LED brightness brings the image out a little bit. And you can see things really, really well in that mode as well. And um, the final is projection. Um, so this is just taking an LED or a flashlight and turning all the lights off in a room and you can project an image from the fold scope onto a sheet of paper. And as you can see in this example, everyone can gather around and look at the same microscopic specimen 
simultaneously, which is really valuable if you think about normally students are looking to, into the microscope one at a time and it feels like kind of an individual or isolating enterprise. Um, and this is a way for people to sort of observe together, which um, is really cool. So um, as we've talked about, Foldscope is assembled from simply a sheet of paper. Um, and so you can ask about how do you make a microscope for $1? Um, and so uh, there's really only a very a few parts of a microscope that are absolutely essential. Um, one is aligning the optical path through the microscope. Um, and so this is where um, kind of we're inspired by the field of origami um, because origami can make folds very precisely and very repeatably. So you can, by following the same set of instructions, get basically the same object every time. Um, and this isn't true necessarily for a bunch of different materials. Um, and so we've actually done this experiment where we've assembled a bunch of these by hand and we've looked at what is the error um, in the alignment of the different optical components. And the error between different assemblies, even assembled by different people, is less than the um, thickness of the paper that we use in Foldscope. So it's very, very reproducible and very accurate. Um, paper is also light, so it's easy to carry with you. It's very, very cheap, which is maybe the most important part here. And um, it's surprisingly strong. Um, it can tear pretty easily, but um, it's surprisingly strong. Um, and so we've also, in this, in deciding to use paper, we're also inspired by a lot of kind of flat and foldable technologies that um, have been coming up in various fields to um, make things very scalable and very shippable. Um, so you can think, I mean, one example is if you've been to Ikea, you can see you know, the, how the volume of furniture that they're able to provide um, and for the price that they're able to provide it at. Um, this is a context, this is um, a example of uh, refugee housing that is being supplied currently. Um, and it starts as this fully, I forget the square footage of this, uh, uh, of this uh, shelter, but it all comes in a few, a few cardboard boxes. Um, and so this idea that um, kind of folding, um, folding things from, from initially flat materials can give you, um, can give you a lot of power. Um, so beyond aligning an optical stage, maybe the most important, the, the essential part of a microscope is really the lens itself. Um, and that's all the Foldscope does and all Van Leeuwenhoek's uh, microscope do is they leverage the power of a lens um, to interact then with light in the sample. Um, and so we've used this idea of micro-optics, which is a fancy name for using very, very small optical elements um, to uh, get very, very impressive magnifications from them. And so I'm going to play this video here, which is a, a descript, uh, description that KQED, which is a public radio, or, um, in San Francisco did about the micro-optics in Foldscope. Microscopy is all about using surfaces to bend light in different ways to make an image that was initially small very large. As light travels from the object through a lens, it is bent or refracted, and the image appears stretched. The stretched light falls on a sensor, either your eye or a camera, and that's where the virtual image forms. One of the things that we do in Foldscope is use this idea of micro-optics. Micro-optics are optical components that are small. The smallest micro-optics that we have used has been around 200 microns, which is smaller than a grain of salt. The smaller a circle is, the more curved its surface. And the higher the curvature of a lens, the more the light passing through it can be bent. In the highly curved lenses used in the fold scope, light can be bent at very sharp angles. The smaller the lens, the sharper the angle, and the higher the magnification. One of the things that people don't realize is even though our optical elements are simplistic in their form, to understand them very well took a very long time. Um, and so to build off the point Manu was making at the end of that video, which is that there's actually a ton of uh, mathematical modeling that goes into even a very, very simple process like this. And that's something we focus on a lot in the lab is um, actually getting very precise models of very simple systems. So this is all characterization that was published um, in 2014 when we published the paper on the Foldscope. And um, a lot of these points are making kind of this similar idea that as the radius of your lens decreases, the magnification power increases. Um, so as you can say here down in the blue, we have a bigger radius and lower magnification. And as we climb up here, we're making 
magnification much, much greater, and we're making the um, diameter of the lens very, very, very small. Um, and there's, there's tons of information you can synthesize from these graphs. Mostly it's just to give you a sense of, um, you know, there's a lot of math that goes behind this um, to understand these systems really well, and well enough that then you can start to um, change and build on them. Um, and this is kind of a level of characterization, sort of maybe what distinguishes it a little bit from the early microscopes from Van Leeuwenhoek is uh, sort of the amount of sophisticated math that we're putting in is uh, at a different degree. Um, and so the other nice thing about Foldscope is that paper base of the Foldscope is um, easily interfaces with any sort of micro optic component you want to put in. And so these are just four that we've used somewhat extensively. Um, when we're sending our fold scopes out in bulk, we're really only providing this 140x lens, which is very, very powerful. And I'll show you um, a bunch of footage from the 140x lens. It's actually what you, the, some of the other magnifications kind of can give you a level of detail that is actually, makes it harder to sometimes know what you're looking at. Um, but a couple of important points here are that, um, if you look at the price points here too, the performance that we get for the six cent lens is you sort of get a drop off in the performance that you get as you, as you climb up in price point. Um, uh, so, you know, we can pay 10 times as much for this sapphire lens, but we actually don't necessarily get 10 times the performance, especially in terms of resolution. So um, even if you're magnifying the image more, the resolution, which is actually the real power of a microscope, you know, how close can two things be, and you can actually tell that they're two separate things, the resolution doesn't increase by a ton, even though the magnification increases greatly. So you can actually approximate a similar magnification by using a lower lens and digital zoom. So you can see this also when you hook up your fold scope to a smartphone, is you can actually use a digital zoom to get much, much beyond 140x. Of course, what you can't beat, what's inherent in the lens itself, is this resolution value. Um, but that said, for applications that you know, require higher magnification, some of these lower resolution points, um, we are gonna make the, you know, the other lenses available sort of um, for, for custom situations. Um, and this is another element that, um, you know, at this point we have sort of tested every lens we can get our hands on. We haven't done a lot of the production of lenses in-house. We've been sourcing them from other places. Um, and this is something a future direction we you know, might get into. Um, of course, we want to keep costs as low as possible, so sort of the, developing the infrastructure to do all of the lens manufacturing uh, very well might be prohibitive, but this is something we would like to do at some point in the future, is sort of manufacture our own lenses. Um, this is briefly um, the three ways in which you can move the Foldscope around to look at a sample. So there's a stage that moves X, Y. Your sample stays put in the middle. It mounts right here, and the stage moves in X, Y around it, and then to focus on it, there's this flexure mechanism in paper where you can pinch or pull in on the sides of the paper and the stage, the focusing stage, will move up or down. Um, so that's really leveraging sort of like the flexibility and strength of paper to allow you to do that without it, without it breaking. Um, so what can you see under the fold scope? We haven't gotten to a lot of that yet. Um, as I mentioned before with germ theory, you know, every um, human parasite has a face to it and you can look, identify these under a microscope. So these are a variety of, um, of diseases. This is Giardia, Leishmania, which is actually uh, currently a huge epidemic in Syrian refugee populations. Um, C is Chagas disease, which is um, you know, mostly endemic to South America. We have E. coli, which you can find in Chipotle burritos, and a bunch of different things. Um, beyond the health kind of context here, which I think these first A through G really uh, points out. Um, it, and I'm not talking a lot about the health context tonight, um, but that's another area that, that Foldscope has a lot of potential in, right, is doing these very, very cheap diagnoses of very various diseases. Um, tonight, I guess I'm mostly interested in telling you kind of about the science educational component of it, because that's what we're moving forward with most quickly in the short term. Um, but H and, H and J kind of start to demonstrate these. So we're starting to look at some unidentified bug species. And J especially is, is cool because there's a story behind a, a student saying, how do you look at, how, they ask the question, how strong is an ant? Um, what this is, is this is a cross-section of an ant leg muscle that's taken under the fold scope. And of course, this isn't quantitative, but you can take that same student and show them, 
you know, the fibers in the muscle and how they reinforce each other um, and start to take something that's a very, you know, well-known fact that ants are very, very strong and actually start to show them some of the evidence that can maybe corroborate that observation. And so that's often a very, very cool moment when you start making connections between something you kind of know in your general life or in the macroscopic world and actually see the level at which microscopic detail reinforces that. Um, so this is just kind of a, a sort of a best in show. This is all, um, this is from a video that the New Yorker made um, in 2015, but mostly this is just to show you some of the sort of beautiful images we've seen under the fold scope, or videos, I should say. Ecosystems are not just based on large species. So when I walk in the forest, I'm not just looking at the big trees, but I'm also looking at the fungus and the insects crawling around. There are insects with wings and fully functional machinery that are even smaller than a dot that you write on a piece of paper. One time I was waiting for my train actually to come and this very, very, very tiny bug landed on the rim of my coffee mug. I trapped it in one of my slides and I was absolutely shocked when this insect actually started laying eggs right inside the slide. The resources that were dedicated in that insect just for production for progeny is really everything. That teaches you something a little about why life is so resilient. It's just such an immense opportunity to come to this world and not know. It's not just for scientists to figure out how the world works. That is truly actually a passionate thing that we all start with. We all start by being curious about the world. We are born with this and we really need to culture this because fundamentally curiosity needs to be nurtured and kept alive. So that's just beyond some of Manu's great uh, poetry there. You can see just some of the amazing things you can see under the fold scope. Um, it's really, it's really amazing. Just if you spend an afternoon um, just asking, you know, what are all the things I can look at under this instrument? I've had many, lost many days that way. Um, there are not lost days, I should say. Um, so, so one thing on a production level, and this is sort of, um, this is the the old version. I can't show you the new version of production because it's not, you know, entirely everything in place yet. But this is how we used to make microscopes, which is in the lab at Stanford, all with uh, homemade robotics. And so, you know, the paper itself is pretty easy to, to cut, um, but some of the apertures and the plastic pieces that hold the lens in, and then that also hold the magnets in, and so that you can connect, the magnets are what attaches the phone to the fold scope. These processes are all made in the lab with this reel-to-reel -reel manufacturing method. Um, and you maybe saw a, snip shot, a snippet of this earlier, but so this is the lens machine in work. So what it's doing is the lenses are in that funnel and that's just making sure that they're coming down one at a time and they're getting inserted into the aperture there in this reel of tape. It's a very, very simple machine. And the simplest part here is at the end. <laughs> Robot scissors. <laughs> so that's sort of the spirit we work under, is the spirit of frugality. Uh, you know, most things, there's actually very, very simple low-tech solutions to. <laughs> um, so um, this, I'll just show you briefly this next, this next video, which is the similar idea, but for the magnets. And so we have, they're kind of coming down in two orientations. So one is coming down north facing, one is coming down south facing. Um, and, and the reel is, is moving. Again, this one, this one moves very, very slowly. So that's kind of a, a brief 
glimpse at what it, you know, what the machines looked like in the lab when, when they were functioning. Um, you know, the initial challenge was, can we make 50,000 of these? Um, and it took a lot of hours, especially with those um, machines I was showing you. But the answer is yes, we can make 50,000. Um, and the question is, what do you do with all these microscopes? And we, we wanted to make them, you know, as widely available as possible. And so the way that the Foldscope pilot program functioned, which was started in 2014, was we provided a microscope to, until we ran out, to anyone who wrote in and gave it, and basically just had to write a sentence about what they wanted to do with it, a th question they had or what they would want to look at or who they would want to give it to. Um, and so we ended up shipping these, you know, all over the world. Um, we've reached a hundred and more than 130 countries at this point with Foldscopes. Um, and this map is actually missing some countries. So we recently did workshops in Madagascar and brought a bunch there. Um, Madagascar is fascinating because it's, I think, the fifth poorest country in the world, but has maybe the most impressive biodiversity in the world. And so just the chance of a student there discovering a new species by just going into their backyard and looking at something under the fold scope is like a very, very real probability. Um, another place that we've um, been to, not been to, but have shipped microscopes to since this is, um, we shipped our first one to Iraq recently, um, just to a very, very curious uh, high school student who just passed his college entrance exams in Iraq who wrote us um, asking for, for a fold scope and we, and we shipped him one and surprisingly FedEx would, was able to make the, the delivery. It was very, very close to Mosul. Um, um, so this is, you know, th it's hard to talk about a community at this point, even a community that's you know, 50,000 wide. Um, and so try to do it in a few ways. One is with, one is with the map. Um, one is just kind of, um, there's you know, all the different faces that, that go into this. And so um, the breadth of people we've worked with, students of all ages, um, people all parts of the world, people with a range of science experience, from students that have never encountered science to students that are actually very interested in science but have never had the opportunity to use a microscope to professional researchers. We've encountered you know, all of these people along the way um, and you know, it's, it's a really universal experience uh, using the Foldscope and you know, asking questions and especially when it's a group effort and people are feeding off one another and, um, and creating hypotheses and testing them. It's really wonderful to see. Um, one thing we wanted to do was to document this pilot program in some way, in a way that wasn't too um, obstructive to the people using it. Um, they didn't have too many requirements, I guess. So for those that can um, get online, which is a good percentage of the world now, we set up this blog called the Microcosmos blog. Um, and they're, you know, beyond basic censorship, there's no um, rules to posting in the blog. You can post just a picture of what you see on a given day. We have users that post very, very long um, posts. Uh, we have, you know, college workshops that have posted on here. Uh, we've had Foldscope clubs that have formed just to use the Foldscope on weekends that have made posts. Um, and we've had posts in over a dozen languages. So um, we truly kind of hope that this, this represents really kind of our global community and the variety of questions that people are answering. Um, this is just sort of a, this video was made a while ago, but it, um, at, this, at the time this was sort of a summary of all the posts that had been made up to that point. I think this was a couple years ago, right after the pilot had launched. Um, but again, this talks about what I was mentioning earlier with the textile anthropology. There's sort of an unimaginable number of applications that we've been exposed to um, from the Foldscope. And this blog is still going today. So there are posts being made pretty much every day on, on Foldscope. Um, from new users to experienced users, who we call our super users. And one thing is it's a pretty, pretty interactive community. So a student in India might post a question and then people all over the world can respond to them and say, oh, you know, again, we, we try to stay away from this model of correcting people or telling them they're wrong, but asking follow-up questions and saying, have you tried looking at, you know, have you tried looking at this bug? Um, a similar, I have a similar bug in, you know, in my country and then here's what this looks like. Um, so there's a lot of kind of um, information uh, exchange that happens through this website and we hope to you know, keep this going and mature the website somewhat to encompass as we grow. Um, but it's really cool to see this is just an example of people have, you, some users have posted, taken the initiative to translate the full scope instructions and post them in different languages. Um, so it's cool to see.
Um, and so, so uh, one thing before we kind of go into specific examples within the community is it gives you a tremendous power actually to have, you know, 50,000 or hopefully millions of people around the world with microscopes. Um, in the perspective of biodiversity, you know, 99% of species on this planet are microscopic and can't be seen with the naked eye. Um, and so just from a biodiversity perspective, really cataloging that and seeing what's out there, there's a tremendous value to, you know, the increasing the number of people that are actively doing this. So this is, uh, this is also a year or so old, but this is at the time when people had seen over 150 species across 80 different orders under the fold scope. So this ranges from bacteria to insects to protozoans to fungi to slime molds, kind of all manner of life forms. Um, and then, you know, to, to focus in on an area from, from the world to, to one particular place, this is actually a particular place I like to, to run around as Lake Merritt in Oakland, California. And um, actually next, uh, a little bit less than a week from today, Foldscope, we're gonna do a, what we call a microbio blitz, which is we um, have a, a workshop where we give the participants Foldscopes and we try to catalog as many species and as many life forms in a certain area as we can, you know, over the course of, a, of an afternoon or an evening. Um, and it can be a really fun activity, a really engaging way of getting people excited about natural history and excited about microscopy and doing science. Because um, again, people come into it with a range of backgrounds. Um, one thing that's cool about Lake Merritt in particular is Lake Merritt is called a lake, but it's actually an estuary of the San Francisco Bay. And so as such, it is connected to the oceans and you get species in Lake Merritt that had previously only been seen in Japan. Um, so there's a kind of a crazy amount of biodiversity that you can see in any particular part. Um, we've had users in New York City find all kinds of species in New York City. Um, you know, just living your environment, like life persists in almost all environments. So whether you're urban or rural or wherever you're living, you know, there's an incredible amount of biodiversity to be found. Um, so briefly, I'm just gonna take you through some Foldscope posts just from the last few weeks to kind of show you what it looks like on a day-to-day -day level. Um, this was uh, a user who posted from Mexico. This was the, just received a Foldscope. This is their first time, their first time using it. And um, what they're looking at is they, 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 um, they stained it with a P and E stain and they're able to see the difference between their red blood cells and their white blood cells. So the little discs here are red blood cells. And then this in the middle, can't tell if it's a leukocyte or what it is, but you have a white blood cell there. So red blood cells, right, don't have nuclei and don't have many other compartments that most cells have because their main job is to, to carry uh, oxygen around around the body in the form of hemoglobin. So there's these very specialized, very small cells. Um, whereas, you know, the white blood cell has sort of a, a wider range of performs to function, uh, forms to perform, functions to perform. And so, um, you know, you can just start to learn a lot just about your own, own blood just by looking in the fold scope. And so um, it's, it's, it's cool to see, see something like this. Um, this one's kind of funny. This is a user in DC. Um, she uses the fold scope a lot with her dad and she recently got lice. Um, and so naturally, they say, on December 6th, I got lice on my head. I was curious to see what it was. So me and my dad took two lice that I had on my head and put it under the fold scope. I learned lots of new things about lice. I learned that lice are insects because they have six legs. I saw that the antenna had five brick-like things in the adult louse and four brick-like things in the young lean, and goes on from there. Um, and so the way that a lot of this biology impacts us kind of organically on a day-to-day -day level is is interesting and cool to see. Um, and the way that this uh, user took what would normally be a pretty terrible experience and turned it <laughs> into sort of like a fun chance to learn something about insects and science is very cool to see. And also this is cool because it demonstrates, um, you know, often it's, uh, we show the full scope with the, like I showed you the footage from the smartphone earlier uh, in the New Yorker video, which is great. but. Um, you know, this is all done without that. And so she actually does drawings. Um, and this is, you know, a four page drawing of the louse that was in her head. Um, <laughs> so that, that's always cool to see. Um, uh, one more I'll show you, a recent Microcosmos post, and then we'll do some more thorough examples. But um, this is from an or a, a nonprofit organization in India called the Agastya Foundation. And um, they work with a lot of uh, rural children. Um, 
And so they're interested in, you know, they, they, um, yogurt's a big part of their diet, and so they're interested in looking at yogurt, cult yogurt cultures under the fold scope. So it's another cool example of um, kind of local context driving different scientific inquiries, which is really cool to see. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip this video. Again, it's sort of about what science can look like in, this is in a, in a U.S. classroom. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm going to go to um, Aaron Pomerant, who's one of our users, who's taken Foldscope to the Amazon and has also actually made this wonderful video about him using it there, so I'm going to play a little clip from, from here. I came across the Foldscope because I conduct research in the Peruvian Amazon and was looking for a microscope I could take with me while backpacking through the jungle. So we've just stopped at this plant because it's got these weird structures on its leaves. These are called galls, and in some cases they're formed by insects, but we're going to take a closer look with the Foldscope right now. So we've just prepared this little slide of what was living inside this gall. So now we're going to pop it into the Foldscope. It just slides in, just like an ordinary microscope slide. And now we can view it through this micro lens. Right now I'm looking at this gall insect. But what's really amazing is that we have the ability to connect a smartphone to the Foldscope, which allows us to take pictures, videos, and view slides together. What we're looking at is an unidentified fly larva, which burrowed into the plant and tweaked its chemistry to create a home for itself, known as a gall. So again, this kind of demonstrates the ability to take something like this to the field um, and to discover new species, um, especially Peru. It's a crazy spot for biodiversity. Um, and so one, one more, and uh, some of our users have made these really amazing videos. So this is from a uh, group called Project Shine that works in Tanzania on um, teaching sanitation there. And so in Project Shine specifically, we wanted to focus on developing locally sustainable sanitation and hygiene strategies for pastoralist communities in the Angora Girl Conservation Area. Exciting, and it is good because... And so in Project Shine specifically, we wanted to focus on developing locally sustainable sanitation and hygiene strategies for pastoralist communities in the Angora Girl Conservation Area. Exciting, and it is good because as... We as Embarrow Secondary School students then Project Shine that using Foldscope we have known about different structures of plants, different structures of microorganisms that cannot be seen by naked eye. So the Foldscope in Project Shine has been essential because what it does is it demonstrates to youth uh, that you can do so much with so little and so really giving them the fold scope and allowing them to explore their surroundings, the, you know, this around the schoolyard and compound at their homes, and encouraging them to use the fold scope to perform investigations. For instance, in the sanitation science fair, um, students had an experiment where they looked at parasites in human and animal feces. So that's just one example of the way that you can use the fold scope or youth can use the fold scope to answer their own questions about the, their surroundings. So one thing we want to do now is sort of provide this experience and to as many people around the world as possible. And so this involves scaling on a number of levels. Um, one way is just scaling the production. And I'm not going to talk a ton about that N today because, I mean, it's, it's, logist it's a logistical challenge, but relatively it's somewhat easy to scale the production and change your manufacturing means. Um, what's a little bit harder is to sort of supply, to scale the, the mentorship that goes along um, with having a program like this. Um, you know, the students that get the most out of the fold scope are answering their own questions, but I've also, you know, kind of people to talk to and are, are getting um, feedback from a teacher. And so um, we've um, pursued a number of avenues for sort of scaling the sort of social implementation of fold scope. One is through doing a bunch of in-person teacher trainings. Um, so you kind of leverage the, this multiplier effect. So rather than going into schools ourselves, training a bunch of teachers to then go and implement it in their, in their schools has been very effective. Um, a couple things is through sort of online uh, materials which we're working on developing so that people can just access those online. Um, one thing three that I'll talk a little bit more about is just um, we're planning on working very closely with a smaller number of organizations um, to develop a sort of like full scope model programs. And so these are organizations that we'll collect a bunch of data from, get a bunch of stories from, and then we can provide these and the curricula they use and the results they get um, to the wider community as examples of implementation in different places. Um, 
that way. It's sort of organically sourced. You know, we come at it from a perspective of open education and we don't want to impose like this is the full scope curriculum because um, one, we think it's important to ask your own questions and two, because like I talked about, local contexts will determine a bunch of different needs and interests. Um, but what, we, what is valuable is to sort of collect and get good documentation on how people are using the full scope. And so we have the sort of model program initiative that we're working on to share those stories. Um, and then another point, another, and then the finally the online community, um, which is somewhat self-supporting in the sense of people that are get invested in it and they want to help other users. And so there's, there's that component as well. Um, these are a few of the programs briefly that we're working on as model programs. I should uh, go through these relatively quickly. Um, this is the Kayani Foundation. So I just sent some pilot units with, with someone to, to Lebanon and um, these are a bunch of schools that work with Syrian refugee girls in Lebanon. Um, and so they have uh, science teachers that are really interested in implementing the fold scope. Also below here, I've just kind of, you know, we get a bunch of, we get a bunch of um, requests from organizations all over the world and sort of seeing the level of interest from people and having the inbox fill up daily with these, you know, really interested, really motivated people that are doing really good work has been just tremendously inspiring for us and really a motivation for us to scale up our project so that we can actually reach all the people that are motivated. Um, this is a project in Louisiana um, working with uh, communities that were um, living in the bayou and were very affected by the Gulf of Mexico, the Horizon uh, uh, oil spill. Um, and so they're looking actually, it's also a biodiversity project, so they're looking at how biodiversity has changed in the Gulf after the oil spill and they're trying to engage um, as an outreach component and engage students in some of these communities that actually received the biggest effect from the spill but have gotten very, very little support. Um, and then we have an initiative at the Peace Corps in Senegal to bring a bunch of um, fold scopes to schools there. And this is an organization that you know, has the potential to, to scale up very, very, very largely, which is exciting for us. Um, and this is just a, a smattering. We're working with organizations all over the place in Mexico and Afghanistan and Cambodia. It kind of goes on and on. Um, in terms of presenting the Foldscope in these settings, we've done a few things. We've sort of modeled the Foldscope into this Foldscope kit that comes with everything you would need to do to perform an experiment. So there's other steps beyond using the microscope. There's you know collecting samples, there's preparing the samples, especially sometimes with, with water samples, like if you take pond water, there's a filtration step you might be interested in doing. Um, and then these also have a few kind of model slides so students can immediately look at something interesting and cool under the fold scope and say, oh, they, I wanna go see now what's in my own backyard. Um, so kind of remodeling it into the science kit has been one component for us for, for outreach. Um, uh, on that um, model two, we have this, you know, we wanna introduce people to the microscopic world. And so we've actually worked with, for a bunch of projects, this really talented science illustrator who I should mention, Rebecca Conti, and she made this fold scope field guide but it's a whole different scale to orient people to in which um, something like a copepod, which is a very, very small little crustacean, is huge in this new ecosystem. And bacteria are very, very tiny. Even though none of these things you can see with your naked eye, um, orienting students to this kind of whole new world is, is a challenge um, and is something that you know, we, it's fun to do with illustration. This is also a really good model to provide for students that are gonna be doing their own illustrations with the fold scope and to show like really what is the power in doing um, science illustration, which is a whole thing I could talk about for a while. But science illustration is really interesting briefly because you're not just recording something, you're actually making decisions about what you're seeing. And so you're synthesizing information as you supposedly just draw what you're seeing. And that's a really interesting um, educational tool. These are more, more examples briefly on illustration. This is from insects from workshops in Madagascar. This is actually a four foot by four foot oil painting that a user made of, um, of, a, of a fly leg that they saw under the fold scope. Um, we are making some improvements to the fold scope design. Um, one of the hardest parts about using the fold scope currently is the focus mechanism. Um, and so we are uh, changing it. So we actually have this paper wedge that's gonna be integrated into the fold scope itself. And the wedge starts very thin on one end and, and gets larger. And as you, um, as you push it in or out, it's just a sliding mechanism and it can flex the, the stage um, up and down. Um, and so that's gonna make it really easy to focus on the full scope. And some of these prototypes are really, really fun to use. Um, and then also different imaging modalities, which basically just depends on how you bring light into the microscope, whether you're bringing it straight on, if you're bringing it at an oblique angle, if you have different filters. Um, and beyond dark field imaging, there's 
polarization microscopy, fluorescence microscopy. There are lots of different um, ways in which microscopes are used that we can then start to approximate with other cheap materials. And so um, we'll hopefully be providing these. Um, and maybe the most exciting thing, which is not, um, which is still in the very early stages, the paper was just published at, by, uh, by Manu's lab at Stanford, but the, uh, the 20 cent uh, paperfuge. So I'll briefly show a video. This paper, this video came out, I think, just a few days ago. So this is very, very new. So we hope that with, you know, Foldscope and Paperfuge, and there's actually a number of other projects as well, um, that, you know, we can start to create kind of a lot of the elements of, of a science lab available for very cheaply and, and out of paper, um, which, is, which is really exciting. Um, uh, so I should briefly give shout outs to the rest of the Foldscope team. This is Manu, uh, assistant professor at uh, Stanford University, an amazing, amazing person, really, really an inspiring uh, figure to work with. Um, Jim is a really brilliant mechanical engineer um, who's actually now the CEO of the Foldscope Instruments, the entity, and so he's learned a lot of business on the fly, which has been very impressive. And then Christine just does like five, she's like five departments in one. She's like a legal department and an accounting department and an IT department and marketing department. Um, and so she's just been, been great. And then, and then I'm here today. Um, I should acknowledge, you know, we've had a bunch of funding support over the years. Um, starting with the Gates Foundation, funded a lot of the early work. Uh, most recently, especially the Moore Foundation, has uh, helped us a lot. They, um, they actually sponsored the, the, our office space as this uh, sort of um, open science incubator in San Francisco that they, that they sponsor. Um, and we've had you know, partnerships with a bunch of different organizations that have helped, our, um, helped us develop and, and do outreach with the Foldscope. And then, I mean, just the number of people that have contributed in a pretty significant way to the project as advisors or as um, you know, implementing Foldscope programs in their own countries is really, really amazing. So there's really too many, too many people to thank. Um, but finally, I should thank you all for showing up tonight and taking some time out of your week to listen to me and to, to hear about Foldscope and frugal science. Um, this is also the obligatory social media slide, so if you want to follow us on any of these mediums, please do. Um, I should mention that on February 1st, we are going to have Foldscopes available for pre-sale. Um, so there'll be a chance to order them for yourself or to order classroom kits. Um, there's also going to be a donation program, so there'll be ways to um, uh, nominate um, schools that you want to receive donations, or if you yourself want to donate, you'll be able to look at this list and say, I want to direct my donation to this school. Um, and so that's an important component for us, so that's going to be in there. Um, if you have any want to reach out and talk about anything, you can email us at info at Foldscope, or my personal is max at foldscope.com. Um, so feel free to feel free to reach me there um, or talk to me after after the talk. We're going to be doing a few more demos too. So if you haven't seen it in action, we'll get to that. So yeah, that's all I have for you tonight. We do have time for a few questions, and Chris. Scott, have a microphone, so if you want to raise your hand, we will identify you, and then we'll make sure a 
microphone gets to you about the microscope. Anybody have any compelling questions or dying to ask? Yes, Indy. Well, I'm a microscopist, right? So, um, so you said like the smaller the bead, the higher the magnification. Mm -hmm. Got it. But smaller the bead, the higher the aberration as well, right? How are you going to make it clearer with s such a small bead? I mean, that's definitely a limitation, right, of using the really uh, simple optical components that we have. Um, we've tried a few prototypes with um, other, with, with more lenses embedded into the fold scope. Um, and so we've tried them with condenser lenses in the back for the light source. Um, so that's definitely an area that we would look into is um, using, um, using, using other lenses to correct for some of that aberration. Um, but we mostly want to keep it as a single lens system. And I can show you some of the images that were taken with the uh, 2000X. Um, go way back now. Um, because some of the bacteria images here, these, um, these five are all taken with the 2000X lens. So we can get pretty decent resolution still um, with that lens. Um, without a ton of aberration. You talk about uh, sending these all over the world and the cost is only a dollar, but what about, you talked about FedEx going to Mosul. <laughs> what would it cost to, to get it to Mosul? Oh, what is the cost on that? Christine sent that package out, so I actually don't know. Um, I know that we've spent, especially in this early stage of the project, um, where a lot of the money was coming in through you know, foundations and such, um, spent thousands and thousands of dollars on shipping itself. Um, and so this is um, maybe one of the biggest logistical challenges we have, is finding the cheapest shipping vendors we can. Um, certainly, we can't give free international shipping to everyone that orders one, um, but we're looking to find kind of distributors in different parts of the globe. Uh, that will help reduce that uh, right, reduce that cost. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with a tool like this, it's frustrating because the shipping becomes the more expensive part, and that's not something we have the infrastructure right to create like a whole new shipping network. Then maybe we should, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's a challenge for sure. Scott, we have a couple of people in the front. Thanks. No, well, please wait for the microphone. How many will you produce in 2017? So the goal is to produce uh, a million in 2017. Um, it seems based on, you know, it's hard because we, we, we haven't had a ton of data for, you know, to model it on. Um, I mean, anecdotally, it seems like yes. Um, Based on, you know, we just ran a Kickstarter campaign in the month of December, basically. Um, and we got, you know, a good, I think about 8,500 backers through that, uh, which, was, which, was really, which was really great to see. Um, definitely for reaching that a million mark, though, um, you know, we're going to need to pursue a lot of larger partnerships, larger scale partnerships. So we've been working with the Peace Corps, we're actually working with 4-H, we're working with some national parks uh, organizations. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the scale, you know, finding organizations that can scale up their implementation is important to us as well. Yeah. How well does it work if you just use a drop of liquid instead of a glass lens as your, uh, so you can skip the whole lens altogether and just ship the paper? With no lens at all? Use a, a bead of water to form the lens. Like to hold that? I don't know. I don't think. I don't think we've done that test um, because it, I don't. We have to. You mean like just suspending like a bead? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what what uh, um, success have you had in in getting governmental and NGO organizations that say, for instance, that deal with public health or water. Uh, inspection uh, uh, to uh, uh, to use these. Um, we've definitely been. Um, there's a few countries where we've had 
um, a lot of governmental contact. One is Argentina. So we've had a lot of discussions with the Argentina Minister of Education about kind of broader scale implementation. Um, uh, another big governmental partnership we've had has been in India with the Department of Biotechnology there. Um, and so we're definitely starting to get to the point where we um, you were reaching some of these audiences that have really, really large scale uh, implementation capabilities. Um, and in these places, we're starting to run sort of smaller scale pilots. And I think that the, you know, those are going pretty well and they start to see the power of, um, of this. And um, you know, it's still a challenge is, is still like having the, the human resources to implement. Um, and you know, if you're gonna do it through schools, doing teacher training, getting all the teachers on board, getting it uh, into a curriculum, um, you know, ideally we can surpass some of that and provide just a lot of the educational and training materials online. Um, still, that can only go so far. And I think having, you know, mentors and um, teachers on the ground is a really important thing. And it's why sort of with the organizations we've been partnering with, we've been looking for organizations that have, you know, a history of working in the settings that they work in. Because um, that's just, you know, makes us feel much more confident that it'll be a successful implementation. Um, it's very evident that you have gone into schools around the world, not so much perhaps in this country. I'm specifically interested in the in the possibility on an elementary school level, level um, here in rural upstate New York, also in Vermont, New Hampshire. There are many farm to table programs, and it's not just the schools bringing food in that have come to the local farmers, but for instance, having um, Growing, growing small crops, having gardens at the schools, mm -hmm. and the idea of them being able to really realize it's, well, sure, that's a cucumber. Yeah. But oh. what's in the ground and all the rest of it, and the possibility of getting into American schools? Oh, it's, it's a phenomenal idea, and I think, you know, I might have kind of skimmed over the, the map briefly, but, um, you know, I've highlighted a lot of the international examples here, but you know, most of a lot of people heard about us in the U.S., and so actually a lot of, you know, a lot of, yeah, a lot of implementation has happened in the U.S. And actually, similar programs to uh, what you've mentioned, you know, people that are teaching like a garden kind of class, um, it's a really great setting for that because you know, identifying microorganisms, looking at different stages of plant life, um, looking at seed coatings. There's it's, it's a really, really great setting and one that makes it very relevant for students to follow kind of different elements that go into it. So yeah, I mean, um, you know, if you like, I can always connect you to people that have done similar programs if like you're interested in, wow, I pressed the button I wasn't supposed to press. But it's, it's salvageable. It's fine. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, I think that's like one, of, that's a really excellent um, way of, of, of introducing it, especially to elementary schoolers. Yeah, ask a question. What is your favorite thing that you've looked at under a full scope? What is my favorite thing I've looked at under a full scope? Um, my favorite thing has been, um, so, um, I mean, my favorite experiment generally is looking in pond water um, because there's just a crazy diversity of, of organisms. Um, I think my favorite uh, things in pond water, do you know what diatoms are? So diatoms are these little uh, single-celled algae creatures that, um, so they, they, because they're algae, they, they do photosynthesis, but they build these very, I wish I had a picture of me, but they build these very like elaborate um, kind of like glass houses around themselves, so these silica-based structures. And there are these crazy symmetric, like crazy symmetrical geometry. So there's like stars and there's, you know, like ovoid ones and there's um, all kinds of like shapes. Um, and there's always this kind of like beautiful symmetry of this sort of like photosynthetic thing that is building its glass house around it. So I always find this cool. <laughs> How about the durability issue? How long do you think those things last? Um, so there's lots of modes in which you can try to destroy something. Um, <laughs> like I can't, <laughs> I can't guarantee against you know like nuclear fallout. Uh, we've you can stomp on it. We've had an elephant step on it and it works. So being crushed, it doesn't crush very easily. Um, you can actually use we, if you come to the demo table after. They actually don't. It's a synthetic paper that doesn't tear very well. Um, and in terms of waterproofness, we've left them in like a, a jar of water for a couple weeks and pulled it out and it works. Um, that said, probably the Achilles heel is the lens itself. 
um, and will end itself getting scratched. Um, once that happens, it's you know that's it's harder hard to salvage. Um, luckily, the lens is not even necessarily the bulk of the cost of something like this. The paper is actually itself is cost more. Um, and so the lens, the lens we use, a 140x lens, is six cents. So in terms of replacing lenses, it's not really a problem. But yeah, I'd say the lens scratching is probably um, the most common failure mode. Or the other common failure mode, which we're addressing in the next round, is during the assembly step, we've had a few places where there's a fold, and the, there's a crease indicating a fold, but some people have indicated that as a tear, or per perceived that as a tear in place. <laughs> And so making the, full, the assembly a little bit clearer and a little bit just easier. We're actually, the next version of Foldscope is going to be have fewer assembly steps, uh, which, which should be a good thing. Yeah. Are all of these images really produced with a smartphone? And what brands of smartphone work with it? <laughs> it's like the iPhone 14. <laughs> it's going to be in a while. Um, I think mostly iPhones. Yeah, I think most of them are from me and Manu and Jim, and we all have iPhones. So, yeah. Six, five. Yeah. All right, last question. Why did you choose a borosilicate glass composition for your lenses? Because <laughs> we just love glass so much. <laughs> oh, uh, wh why not go with window glass? Or why not go what? window glass composition, a soda lime, which is much cheaper, or maybe a high index glass like a lead glass? Um, you know, I think Jim did most of the, the early lens testing, and we've kind of gone through with the borosilicate since then. So I actually am not the most informed person to, to answer on that. Um, but I mean, that's, that's one valuable thing we can, I can take from my visit here today is like an actual knowledge of glass. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because that's, I mean, like I said, this is something, especially with the lens itself, is it's been sort of whatever we can get our hands on cheaply. And the, um, you know, the lens we use is not made to be an optical component. It's made to do fluid handling and printers and other things like that. Um, and it just you know, happens to be because of those settings, it's made in bulk. And so we can get it really, really cheaply. Um, and then the polish on it happens to be really important. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we've tested a bunch over the, I should, the simple answer is we've tested a bunch of lenses over the years, and we haven't found anything that beats the current one we use in terms of performance. And we think a lot of it has less to do with the, necessarily even the, the size and the radius, but the, the, the polish on the lens. So we've had another vendor tell us they're manufacturing the exact same thing with the exact same specs, and um, it doesn't perform as well. So there's something about the polishing process that is, seems to be the most um, important for quality. We were privileged to spend uh, the bulk of the day here uh, at Sullivan Park in the labs of Brian, Indy, Ella. Um, I'm quite confident that if there's any way to improve the glass of the fold scope, it's people here will be able to figure it out <laughs> and will send in their suggestions. With that, uh, again, I'd like to thank Max uh, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.